Hey everyone and welcome back to another video from Maman Talks NRL Supercoach. In today's video, big deep dive, we're going through the center wing position analysis for 2024. Hope you all enjoy this one. If you do, do please give the video a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing to the channel as well. Uh, more content coming in this last little week before the start of the NRL season, but also more content will come definitely during the season as well. So do hit that subscribe button to make sure you get all the videos and notifications. There is an overall league as well. The group code is 673. 2A1. Some prizes will be on offer for that league, so do get joining in there. Uh, without further ado though, let's get into the video. So taking a look at the center wing position in Supercoach, over the last three seasons, there's been on average three to four centers who make their way into the top 20 averaging players. Not normally at the top end of the averages, more kind of mid to the bottom half of that. That's what we saw last year with Marzu, Jermaine Asako, and Dan Gagai being the three uh, center wings featuring in the top 20. We had four in 2022 being Manu, Ruben Garrick, uh, Val Holmes, and Alex Johnston. 2021, we had Ruben Garrick again with an 88 average. He was phenomenal that season in that very, very high point scoring year. Brian Toto and Alex Johnston again with a 73 average. So what I like to pick out, I guess, from this is that center wing is a high upside position. There is uh, players who can crack that top 20 averaging. And obviously, given that center wing, there's a lot more players in the pool. You're going to find a lot of players generally getting around that 65 plus average. What I'd tend to find also with the center wing, it's more volatile. And you probably know this as well. Like apart from Ruben Garrick and Alex Johnston, they're the only two players who actually repeat in the last three seasons. It's not like a halfback where you've got Hines and Cleary. It's not like Hooker where you've got Harry Grant or second row forward with like a Fafita or even a fullback where some of the names are pretty common. It's really a position that chops and changes apart from maybe a Garrick. But again, he's even got his own flaws potentially this season playing in the centers. So what I'm thinking of in terms of like a strategy for team building for round one, I'm probably not going to be paying top, top dollar for a center wing. And I think that is just one due to volatility. It's hard to get a read of, you know, are these players going to replicate what they did last year? But also in the first kind of maybe three to four rounds of the season, it's typically lower scoring. There's not so many blowouts because teams are generally prioritizing on defense and also attacks are just generally not so slick because players are not fully in rhythm yet. So I instead am feeling, you know, someone like a Mazu, I think he's like 789k. I would much rather use that money and get someone like a Harry Grant in a pretty weak hooker position. Whereas with center wing, you sometimes can get lucky if you take a chance on like a 500, 600k guy. They nab a couple of tries early in the season and they can start making some money or even match some of these really, really high priced guys. So I'm personally not looking to spend really, really big at center. I will hopefully try to get someone around that five, 600k range just to add some solidity, but I'm not going to be paying probably 750k plus. I just think with the team structure, trying to fit in other guys like Dylan Brown, gun fullbacks, gun halfbacks, it becomes very difficult. And I do feel like center wing, it's a position where you can kind of bide your time and you can start seeing who are the teams who've actually got that fluidity going, that rhythm going, and you can see who is actually scoring the points and who's not defending very well. And then you can start targeting matchups to bring in those center wings for that high scoring try runs. So that's kind of how I'm looking at with center wing. This could be proven wrong because someone like a Greg Marzu started last season very, very strong, but he was also coming at a much cheaper price. Whereas this year he's coming in at top dollar. So I think it's about trying to find at the beginning of the season, taking that bet on who's the next guy in that four or 500k range who could potentially get up to that 650, 700k keeper elite status. So that's my view on the center wing and the team makeup, but we'll talk about the players now in more detail. So just before I talk about the players in a little bit more detail, another thing I want to think about as well with the center wing is, you know, we're obviously much more attacking stat reliant. So I pulled these stats from, I think it was NRL Stats Insider, a great website that I got this resource from. It was the try scoring map for 2023. And it was very, very useful to see, you know, of the teams from last season, where were the areas of the field that they prioritized in terms of scoring their points. And so I've got a few notable notes uh, a little bit below me, but in general, take some time to actually look at this data because it is quite intriguing seeing some of the trends. A lot of it is very obvious, but a lot of it sometimes does have some, own, some of its own kind of interesting insights. So the first thing that stuck out to me was the uh, South Sydney Rabbitohs and the Cronulla Sharks. Two teams who are very reliant on their edges uh, for scoring attacking points and scoring tries in general. So with the Rabbitohs, we can see here, uh, they only scored 15% of their points in the middle. And with the Cronulla Sharks, it was 18%. Another team like that was also the Broncos, who were only 17% points, uh, sorry, 17% of tries actually scored in the middle. So this shows you that generally these guys are going to be scoring their tries on the edges. And that makes complete sense when you look at, you know, the Rabbitohs, we know that deadly left edge, 
Last year, the right edge was really good for them as well. You think about the Broncos and their success last year, a lot of it was due to Reese Walsh floating on both sides of the field. And with the Cronulla Sharks, a lot of it was due to Nico Hines and then those dangerous outside backs, you know, Mulatalo, Jesse Ramian, uh, Sivitalikai, etc. Whereas the back rollers are typically not as attacking, uh, aside from, say, obviously a Britain Nicaragua. Other things that I did lean into, teams who had a certain bias to their right-hand side, Broncos being one, obviously a lot of tries scored by Katoni Staggs and Selwyn Cobbo. Um, the Dolphins also on the right side, very obvious with uh, Jermaine Asako having a tremendous season last year. They scored uh, 43% of their tries to the right edge. Dragons right side dominated as well, largely probably due to Zach Lomax. Warriors also right side. We saw that so much last season, that deadly combination of uh, SJ to the sweeping CNK to the DWZ, all those good old abbreviations. They had a really, really strong season last year. 49% of tries scored on their right side. Something that may not continue this season with obviously two of us, who we'll definitely talk about in this video. Coming back into that team, he's probably going to command some of the ball a little bit more towards him. So that's one trend I would expect to change, but you can see Last year, there was this really strong right-hand side bias for the Warriors. Teams with their left-hand side, we've already kind of touched on the South Sydney Rabbitohs. So, you know, we saw Alex Johnson in 2022 and 2021. He's a guy who, if they've got a good run and is coming in at a cheap price, he's someone you can always target because we know that the Rabbitohs love targeting their left-hand side, which could be even stronger this season with Jack Whiten on that left-center position. Um, the uh, Newcastle Knights is another big team. So just having a quick look here, 43% of their tries scored on the left edge. A lot of that is due to, obviously, Kalen Ponga. And we saw last year that combination of Greg Marzu, Bradman Best was really, really good for them. So that's one edge also that I'm definitely prioritizing, which is which is a reason why Greg Marzu is obviously a very popular option uh, as a premium center wing. Gold Coast Titans, 53% uh, of uh, try scored on the left-hand side. I don't necessarily think this is due to just the winger himself in Cam Pereira, who was obviously good for them last year. That is Kieran Foran and Dave Fafita written all over. Kieran Foran obviously commanding a lot more of the ball, Fafita was just unbelievable last year. He created a lot of those extra attacking stats for the likes of Akam Pereira, who scored so many tries. So again, which is why when you know we talk about second row forward, someone like a Beau Fermor, we want him playing on the left because that left-hand side for the Titans, if Kieran Foran is playing there creating those attacking stats, we want guys on that side of the field. Similar story as well with the Parramatta Eels. So they scored 45% of their tries on the left-hand side. Very, very obvious. You know, Gutherson generally prefers to play on that left-hand side. Mike Acevo is their main attacking outlet for tries um, in terms of a winger. So another side of the field that I definitely prefer if I'm looking at with my Parramatta players. Another reason why people like Sean Lane are very popular. Dylan Brown as well, all playing on that left-hand side of the Eels. We generally think that that is their stronger side. So those are some of the ones that I wanted to call out, I guess, from this slide. But just do take a note of this as well. You know, if you're, if you're umming and ahhing about, you know, two between two players, this try scoring map could lead you to one if you think that a certain team has a certain bias to one side of the field. Um, and also even looking at teams who score a lot of tries through their middle and generally don't get the ball as much to their wingers, you know, that's sometimes teams who I don't generally like to get a lot of their centers and wingers from. An example top of my head is someone like the Can uh, Canberra Raiders, who generally are a middle forward heavy team. And you can see there, 30% of the try scored by the Raiders was in the middle of the field. Looking down the list, that actually looks like the most apart from the West Tigers. So again, a, a small example of that as, you know, some of the reasons why uh, you won't see centers picked from a lot of those kind of teams, like the Raiders or maybe the West Tigers uh, as well. But hopefully you found this slide useful and, uh, and it helps frame your thinking as well when you're looking at uh, picking certain wingers and centers from your various teams. So starting off by looking at some of the more expensive gun players. Now, obviously, I mentioned I'm personally probably not going to be looking at any of these players, more just from a team structure point of view. I definitely don't think that they're bad. And just also a quick note on the ownership stats. I pulled these numbers uh, towards the back end of last week, so they may be slightly different, but hopefully not too different in terms of showing, I guess, the trends. So what I've got on the screen here for all of these gun center wings, and for gun center wings, I kind of looked at uh, top uh, I looked at kind of averages over 67 and what I looked at was their average base power per game Also, a lot of these scores I've un I've adjusted for any potentially injury affected games just to try to equalize everyone I've looked at the number of games that they scored over 90 points and how much of that was a percentage of their total games played So the top two that stand out here Greg Marzu and Jermaine Asako Marzu was fantastic last year base power of 49 so a really really high floor you can see below me he had a base average of 32 which was only better by a few of other players here which is you know Gagai, um, To'o and Isaac Dungo from the uh, Penrith Panthers only 6% owned at the time that I pull these numbers and I think a lot of that is just due to the very expensive price tag the Knights have a pretty decent draw I'd say over the first 10 if you look at the first kind of 
four or five, apart from maybe the Raiders and maybe the the, the Dragons game uh, in round one and round five. Sandwiched between that, you know, uh, Cowboys, Melbourne, and then the Warriors. It's not the easiest games on paper. Uh, we did see that the Knights were a little bit disappointing in that second trial uh, against the Melbourne Storm. Although we did see, again, that left-hand side dominance. You know, Ponga created a line break and created a try for Bradman Best. So a small example of why we want to players from that left-hand side for the Newcastle Knights. With Mazu, I don't really see too much changing, I guess. I mean, he had an amazing year last year, 77-point average. Don't really see the base stats or the base power falling away, to be honest. Like, that's kind of who he is. He takes a bunch of runs and he loves to break tackles. So I don't see that floor changing from him. I guess the question is those extra attacking stats, getting those extra tries to really get him to that kind of 75 plus average. I'm probably more just going to take the bet that tougher draw to start off with. Teams generally aren't scoring as many points at the beginning of the year. I'm taking a bet that he will lose some money at the beginning. Um, He could be a really strong target from round five because if you look at round five to round 10, Dragons, Bulldogs, Dolphins, and the West Tigers in that spell, that is a really good run for the Knights. Another reason why I want Ponga, and maybe you could stack him with Mazu as well. Now, if you're happy with your team build and you can uh, fit in someone like a Mazu, I don't mind that either for the sake of you're saving a trade from the beginning of the season, and a lot of people will be clamoring for Mazu from round five onwards as well. You just probably have to be willing to accept that maybe in the first four to five weeks, the average may be 50, maybe 60s, low 60s, just accounting for obviously he's going to score still some tries, and that floor is still going to be really good. Just that's the only thing I think you need to consider if you're going to be starting with Mazu, but can't fault him really as a pick. Just the price tag, I think, is going to make him very unattractive to a lot of uh, coaches out there. On to Jermaine Sarko, who had an absolutely uh, amazing 2023 season. See the base power not so good as compared to Mazu, 38. But a lot of that is because he's a winger who doesn't take as many runs. But the upside with the Sarko is the goal kicking. And the fact that he just scored so many tries last season. He had the highest uh, scoring average out of all of these gun center wings here with an average of 27 from last year. I mean, the base stats are not bad, right? Like a base average of 28 is pretty solid. But he had nine games over 90 last season. And he had the highest percentage of games where he scored over 90 as 38%. So more than a third of the time he was going over 90 points, which is fantastic. 10% ownership at the moment. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of people aren't too keen on Asako though for this season. And it's not really draw related because the draw for the Dolphins is actually fantastic. They've got the buy in round three, which isn't great, but then they've got home games against Cowboys, Dragons. Then they've got the Titans, West Tigers, just in the opening five. After that, they've got Broncos still in Queensland. Parramatta is an away game, but I believe it's in Darwin, so it's not even that far. Then it's Newcastle Knights, Cowboys, and Manly, all still in Queensland. Like, they really don't leave Queensland that much in the first kind of 10 rounds of the season. So from a draw and a travel perspective, they're really, really good. I think the fault that a lot of people see with the Sarko is, one, can he repeat just that amazing year that he had last year? Uh, the Dolphins, I do think, uh, are going to be uh, maybe potentially struggling for points at the beginning of the season on the basis of Tom Gilbert going down, unfortunately, with that ACL injury. So maybe their go for is not as good. Um, So that's a small factor you could maybe use against the Dolphins as a team in general. But I think it's more also uh, Herbie Farnworth is probably going to be playing right center. Farnworth is typically not the center who will create uh, attacking stats and tries for his winger. Uh, He likes to run the ball himself. He's a bit of a glue hands. Whereas last year, I think you had guys like Brenko Lee kind of just happy to feed the ball onto Osako. Don't think you're going to see that as much this season with Farnworth coming in. That's probably the biggest reason why I think a lot of people aren't starting with Asako. Again, my policy, not necessarily my policy, but just the way that I'm thinking, he's too expensive for me at the beginning of the year. And I would like to see it first and see how Farnworth does impact him. And there is a buy in round three as well. But don't get me wrong, the draw is good. He could come out firing and could quash any uh, kind of uh, doubts over him. But personally, not for me, just when there's enough that I want to still wait and see before I jump on someone like Asako, especially paying that much money. Dan Gagai, uh, 739k, very, very low ownership, only 0.7%. So he's definitely a pod if you're looking for a pod. Um, the thing with Gagai, like he only scored three tries all of last season and still averaged 72. Um, it was the base stats. Like the base stats average of 40 was just ridiculous last season. Um, I just, I don't know if that's repeatable. Like he is a center who does historically get quite a lot of base stats. Both in 2022 and 2021, he had base averages of 34. So that, there was actually a mark step up in 2023. Part of me thinks a year older, if the year before last year was a 34, is he more likely to go back towards that? Maybe even if he goes 36 base, he's still losing out on three points. And sure, the number of tries that he scored uh, was only very 
very low last year, season, only scoring three. A lot of that due to playing outside of Dom Young, who's not there anymore. So maybe more tries will fall to Gagai. But that does also make me think, are they just going to try to get the ball more to the left, to their more dangerous side of uh, Mazu and Brabham Best? So again, expensive price tag, really, really solid floor. Maybe someone that you can look to consider in round five. And he's probably more likely to hold his value because his floor is so good if he does maintain that base. Probably just doesn't quite have the upside if I'm willing to pay that much money. So if you look at a lot of these other centers here, you know, Val Holmes, Asako, Mazu, all over 30% uh, of games that they played last season scored over 90. With Gagai, it was only 15%. He's going to be very solid, lots of kind of 65s, 70s, which is perfectly fine. But if you're paying that money and trying to get 90s, 100s, he's probably less likely to do that compared to a lot of these guys on the list. Uh, with Val Holmes, he's actually very interesting and f not low owned, like 9.4%, but below 10%, I would say that is probably in pod territory. And he is a guy who in the past, people have tried to do anything uh, to make sure that they get him in their team for round one. I don't know about a lot of you, but I'm struggling for money this season. There doesn't seem to be a lot of cheapies, so I just find it difficult to fit in someone like a Val Holmes. And my personal feeling is if I'm going to be spending 730k plus on a Cowboys outside back, I personally would just rather spend that money and get drink order at fullback if you really want to target the Cowboys. And they've got a pretty good draw. Like the first five rounds, they do have the Dolphins, the Dragons, and the Gold Coast Titans. Uh, and then they've got the Knights and the Broncos both at home. Uh, drink order looked really good as well in the trials, which we'll get onto in the fullback video. Uh, Val Holmes, I think if you want him, you really need to be believing in the Cowboys with a really good start. I do think that, that their first 10 weeks is pretty good. They do have Penrith and Broncos, but outside of that, I think the majority of the games are pretty good from a draw point of view. So I don't mind Val. Again, it's just price tag. What you get with Val is obviously he's got the added benefit of being the goal kicker for the Cowboys. He can be a bit frustrating, and I think a lot of people are probably a little bit burnt by last season when everyone went really big on the Cowboys beginning, to begin the season. They had a really good draw. And Val was fine. He was getting kind of like 60s and 65s. He just wasn't getting those 80s and 90s that everyone was paying for. And it was only really during the origin period when he actually did that. So you could take the bet that he can maybe start hot. But again, what I said about limited try scoring in the opening four weeks of the season, probably just enough factors for me to say I won't go with Val Holmes. Ruben Garrick, historically, look, amazing center wing option. We saw in 2022 and 2021, he's been in the top 20 averaging players. He had a game last season where he did play center, and sorry, I should give context, likely to line up at center for Manly this season. Now, he had one game against the Dolphins last season where he scored like 160 plus points and absolutely killed it. His other three games at center were 35, uh, 62, and 26. Again, the opponents were Melbourne, Parramatta, and just having a look at here, Titans. So like the Titans matchup you would look at as pretty good, but only scored, uh, what, the 35 points. And Manly's draw is... Okay, it's not fantastic. Like the first three rounds, you know, against the Rabbitohs, Roosters, and Parramatta is a little bit tough. Dragons around four is, is obviously quite good. But again, I keep talking about Dragons as a good matchup. They could be defensively better as well with Shane Flanagan coming in this year. Similar to Val Holmes, he's the goal kicker, uh, goal kicking center as well. You really need to be banking on Manly, I think, doing really well for Garrick. And I think playing at center, I definitely prefer him playing on the wing because the wingers will generally get more of the bigger attacking stats as in the tries and the line breaks. Center's more likely to get the kind of line break assists or the try assists. But the way that Manly plays is likely going to be kind of turbo creating those attacking stats so the fullback is more likely going to be getting those line break assists try assists not necessarily the center so i'm not comfortable paying that much money for garrick when he's playing out of position for his i guess his historically good position in supercoach being the wing so one probably not for me uh brian toto 720k solid as they come base power average of 47 really good base and work rate of 35 just feels like a guy that he doesn't really seem to go big too often. Like he had four games where he scored over a 90 last season. And I believe three of them were all 100 plus. So 20% of the time he was scoring over 90. Again, I feel like if I'm paying over 700k, I probably want to target a guy who's just a little bit more likely going to be getting those really, really big scores if I'm sp spending that much money at the beginning. I guess the other downside with Toto is the draw. Now Penrith are Penrith. They're the best team that we may potentially have ever seen. But the draw is pretty tough. Melbourne, Parramatta, Broncos... Roosters Manly and then a buy. It's not like it's a sea of green of, you know, Tigers, apologies, Tigers fans, but it's not like it's Tigers, Titans, you know, potentially the Dragons, you know, teams that we know can concede points. Doesn't really look like that on paper. So for me, despite the really good floor, uh, Toto is probably not who I'm going to be going for. I will mention Taylor May a little bit later in the video, but I still am keen on Taylor May despite the draw. But the thing is, 
you're getting him for like almost 300k cheaper than Toto. So you're a little bit more willing to cop the bad draw when you're getting a 300k discount on another on another Panthers outside back. So I'm going to group uh, Isaac Tungo into that kind of discussion as well. Had a really, really good season last year playing at uh, right center, I believe, is where he was doing a lot of his good work outside of Cleary. Really good base at average of 36. But again, tough draw, limited upside as well. 21% of the time he was scoring over 90. Um, he is a pod, but I feel like it's that tough draw and the buy then around six means enough factors for me to not go him. DWZ. We saw how good of a season he had last year. He was a big reason why the Warriors scored 49% of their tries on the right edge in uh, 2023. But I just feel like he's a player who needs to do a lot to get those big, big scores. Like he scored, I think it was like 24 tries overall for the Warriors last season, which was, I think, a club record. So it took a club record of scoring tries for DWZ to average uh, 69.7. I just feel like their draw is also not the best on paper like we're looking at Sharks Melbourne Raiders Newcastle and then the Rabbitohs in the first five weeks followed up by Manly now they looked pretty good in the trials Warriors from an attacking perspective but again similar to what I said with Toto if you want to get a Warriors outside back Roger Tuvasashek is sitting there at a much more cheaper price so with DWZ despite him being a winger which is probably a little bit better for Supercoach not for me, just with the tough draw. And he's got a fairly low base as well. Base average of 25, which is the lowest outside of Nick Meany on this list here. Feels like he just needs to do a lot. Now, we saw some glimpses in the trials. He did score a one or two tries. But again, sometimes he was scoring tries last season and still not even cracking 60 points. Like, I'm having a quick look at here. He had games where he scored a try and scored 50 points, 29 points, uh, 64, 48, uh, 58. So even scoring one try, if you really need him to be scoring doubles and those hat-tricks, I think. And I just feel like, again, going to repeat it, limited point scoring opening rounds of the season, not the best draw on paper, enough reasons for me to fade him. Now, Nick Meany, originally I was going to say not considering at all because of Melbourne's tough start and then the buy in round four. Does look like he's going to retain the goal kicking though, which is obviously a blow for any potential Pappenhausen owners out there. But 694k, with goal kicking is definitely a benefit. He was goal kicking last season, which is why you can see his uh, scoring average was pretty good at 22. Um, not too many other players. All the other goal kickers, basically, apart from DWZ, were around that 20 plus for scoring average. But again, tough draw and then the uh, buy in round four. Enough reasons for me to not consider Nick Meany. Um, he had a good season last year with a 68, but just comes in a little bit too expensive for me, I think, at 694k. Combined with that tough draw, again, not for me, beginning of the year. So I'm going to jump into the category of centers who are between the 500 to 600k range. Um, but we'll definitely talk about ones a little bit more expensive than that, who are probably more in the pod territory. Now, a couple of really notable options here, or well, I'll say three options really stand out in this list here. We've got Jacob Karaz, uh, Hamaso, Tabuai Fado, and then uh, RTS of the Warriors. Now that RTS ownership at 22%, trust me, it's a lot higher now at the time that I've recorded. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's getting close to 30%, and uh, it would probably be over 30% by the time TLT uh, kicks off. But jumping back to the top, Jacob Karaz, average of 59.3 last season, price at 605k. Now, the main appeal with Karaz is the work rate and the fact that last season he was playing very injury-laden, um, and we were hoping for an injury-free season this year, and that way he'd become a really elite super coach option. You may have already heard these stats with Karaz from other podcasts, but uh, average of 59.3 over the season. But last season, before his injury, uh, he was absolutely killing it. So just having a quick look here, up for the first six rounds of last season when he was playing injury-free, he had a base power average of 59. So he was already meeting his total season average purely just in work rate over the first um, six rounds of the season when he was un-injury affected. And that was also an average of 80. So he was absolutely killing it. And it's not like the opposition were technically bad. Like he was scoring 148 against Melbourne, uh, a 92 against the Warriors, 76 against the Cowboys. Like he was putting up some really impressive scores. So I think he had a lot of people very interested in him coming into this year. He's still fairly low, owned at 3.3%. And I don't think that's actually changed that much. The only issue with Karaz is that we haven't seen him yet all trials, and apparently he is having a little bit of a slower rehab from this lower back issue he had from last season. So he was in one of my earlier drafts, I think um, kind of midway through the preseason because of these numbers, obviously in him being on the basis that he was fully uh, injury-free and fully healthy. If he was getting back to that really high base power average of 55+, plus, you're already getting almost value from him without any major attacking stats. That little doubt about his lower back injury is probably giving me enough reason to not have to spend that 600k on him. And I think Hammerso probably becomes a little bit more attractive, I think, if you're willing to spend around that low 600k range on a center wing. So with uh, Hammerso, we already spoke a lot about the Dolphins draw when we were talking about Jermaine Sarko. 
Really, really good long-term draw. The added appeal of uh, Hamaso is that he's a fullback that you can actually get in your center wing. Uh, when you get to the fullback video, or if you're a Supercoach veteran, you may have already known this, but the fullbacks are generally the best players for Supercoach because they get the most involved in the attacking stats. They get the most kind of try assists, line break assists, line breaks themselves, tries, all that good stuff that we want for Supercoach. In an improving Dolphins team who can still find a way to score points, I know what I said earlier about Tom Gilbert, but... I, I, like, I probably made that more as a small argument to not go Osako, but Hamaso, I think, you know, I'd much prefer him, I think, at this point than Jermaine Osako, given that he's much cheaper and playing at fullback, but you can pick him in your center wing. Limited upside, so only scored one game over 90 last year, so translates to only 5% of the time last year was he actually scoring over 90, so I wouldn't be expecting really, really big scores from him very often. Now, he's obviously a gun talent, like he's absolute freak. It's a shame that he's a Queenslander because he absolutely tortures New South Wales in state of origin. But I think a lot of the pick here is on the kind of appeal of the talent of the player and the really good draw. Apart from that, there's probably not... I mean, that's probably the main reasons, I think, to be going him because the work rate's not super high with a base power average of 35. Don't necessarily see that changing too much. He's not generally a base at heavy player. You're going to need more of the attacking stats. But you could very easily see someone like a Tabuai Fido going and averaging 65 this season. And maybe the beginning of the season is a good time when they've got that really good draw. So I think I'm leaning towards him compared to Karaz at this lower 600k range. 18% um, owned, so he's definitely not necessarily a pod. But still, that's not like it's an insanely high, like 50-60% ownership. So you're still getting some value out of him um, in terms of being a differential compared to other players. You know, look at it as 82% uh, of players don't own him. So I, I do like Tabuai Fido. Um, if I can make the team structure work, I may look to get him. But at the moment, I haven't got the budget to stretch up to that 600k center. But he does look very appealing. I'll quickly rattle off a few who I'm, I'm personally not overly interested in, but I had them listed here um, for reference. So one is Alex Johnston. Um, Rabbitohs just have a really, really tough draw, and I just feel like they're a team that you really need to target with their really easy draw. And Alex Johnston is not a base stat heavy player, uh, 20 uh, in base stats average last season, and historically he's never really been a high base stat guy. So I look at him at 596k, potentially one that we can pick up a little bit cheaper. Does have a ceiling, three games over 90 last season, but I just don't really see that happening at the beginning of the year when the draw is tough. Uh, Matt Tumiko from the Raiders, um, he had a really good spell last season where he was just on a run where he was constantly like breaking tackles and scoring like over 70, 75. But then he was very frustrating for people who then brought him in and then just got low scores. Um, he's definitely a pod, 1.9%, good base power as well of 44 the issue with Tomiko is that, um, as we saw before, the Raiders are not necessarily a edge-dominated team. They like to score points uh, during uh, through the middle of their of their team. So with Tomiko, I feel like he could be left frustrated where there are times where ball just doesn't really go to him or the tries just don't really get shared to that right-hand side of the field. Um, he looked pretty good in the trials. He put a move on Val Holmes to score a really good try. Uh, and those are the kind of games that you want from him, but... Getting that week in, week out is probably going to be uh, a little bit less pre uh, less predictable, I should say. So I'm personally not looking at Timiko much heavily. Um, and look, a lot of that is due to the appeal, I guess, of uh, Tuvas Shek. Uh, Kula from the Manly Sea Eagles, so season average of 56.9. Now, he had an unbelievable end to last season where he went back-to-back -back massive tons in the last two rounds of the year, 188 in the final round of the year. I haven't run the numbers as to what his average was without that, but I'm sure it's going to be less than 56.9. And I feel like that score is inflating his score massively when he was playing at fullback, not in the centers. So for me, Cooler's not really someone I'm looking at just because I think he's not really going to be offering you value beginning of the year. Um, Dan Tupo is an interesting one with the Roosters. Now, like, I actually don't have any Roosters players in my team, which feels a little bit weird given that I'm a Roosters fan. Draw is tough. Doesn't necessarily always matter for Tupo because he is a base at heavy guy, like 33 in base last season. Consider that compared to someone like Amazu who was 32. You know, he's got the same amount of base, just doesn't probably get as many tackle busts. So he's got a base power average of 40. And so he kind of feels like someone who he needs to be scoring at least a try and a line break at least one every one, maybe once every two games to be bettering that 55 average. And again, for me, it's a question of draw, not too easy. Roosters historically have been slow starters. I know they're looking to buck that trend this season, but I want to see it before I believe it. And so Tupo, for me, doesn't feel like a guy who's going to hurt me uh, You know, if he goes big at the beginning of the season. He's very low owned as well. But if you're willing to take a pod there, I don't mind him because he historically has been a good super coach option who has averaged over 60, uh, but personally not for me, beginning of the year. Now, the man of the hour that I'm sure a lot of you are interested in, 
Roger Tuovasashek. Now, the numbers that I've got on screen, obviously he didn't play rugby league last season. The numbers I've got on screen is when he was last in Supercoach and last in the NRL when he was playing at fullback. So don't just look at these numbers and think, oh my God, I'm getting someone who in the centers is going to average 67. Those numbers when he was playing at fullback. And we know fullback is the best spot for Supercoach. Um, so maybe don't pay so much attention to those specific numbers. I think with RTS, it's purely just a, a vibes. Do you like what the Warriors are doing? Do you like RTS? And is he going to be roaming? Now, there was some uh, uh, commentary out there that in the media that he was going to do some roaming. Um, now, I should add some context. I'll unfortunately not be able to watch all of the trials in full. I've only been able to watch the kind of KO minis. Now, I did see RTS on the right-hand side of the field um, at one point, but I believe that was because he was playing a little bit of fullback. But... Um, in general, what I just like from the Warriors, I know the opposition wasn't the best in the trials, but they still seem to be pretty slick in attack, still seem to be able to score points. And RTS, I think he's going to bring a lot to that club who already had such a great 2023. And he feels like such a great addition for them. And I feel like I not necessarily go up a level, but I can still see them being able to score a good amount of points. And so there's not really much back in my thinking about RTS being a good option apart from that. We know historically he's been a gun super coach option when at fullback. If he gets any ability to roam as well, like all over that, we love that. You know, being on the left-hand side of the field, right-hand side of the field, just popping up, bobbing up. We know he likes to take a lot of runs. He can get those kind of tackle busts with his footwork. So he's got a game that is well tailored for super coach as well. So just putting bias aside, if you just look at the way he plays, it's a good spot to be in for super coach point scoring. And 539k feels like a pretty good price tag if you're trying to look for someone with a bit of solidity in your uh, center wing position. I uh, believe he scored 70 plus points in the trials uh, based on these uh, uh, scores that were posted. So look, if you want to take that and run with it, then, you know, like definitely go for it. He feels a lot like a vibes eye test pick. He's currently in my updated draft. And I think a lot of that is just due to the eye test, feel good factor with the Warriors. I want to also enjoy the players that I've got in my team. And he definitely fits that bill. Look, he used to be a Roosters player. So I obviously got a bit of a, a bias for him. We said that draw is not the easiest, but look, uh, this probably isn't the best, most objective analysis, but I can still see some games in there where they could score well, like opening round against the Sharks. Sharks still can lead points. Same with the Raiders, um, you know, Souths as well. They could be a little bit slow to start off with. Anyway, I'm just going to make the excuse that I think RTS, not is he's definitely not a must. Definitely a vibes pick. Definitely good on the eye as well. So he's in my team. And a lot of coaches are definitely going that way as well. So for no other reason apart from you don't want to miss out, you know, the good old FOMO, maybe that's a good enough reason to get RTS in your team. Finally, on Dylan Lucas, 502k. Now, I'm probably not going to be starting with him. He was really good in 2023. But there's just a, looks like there's going to be some minutes sharing between him and Kai Pierce Paul in Newcastle. I think Lucas is going to get the start. But without kind of complete confidence of playing 80 minutes, where I believe last season when he played 80 minutes, he was averaging well over 60. Um, I just don't think I can go him when there's a bit of minute sharing involved. And I feel like that just reduces that potential for him to be getting value and actually making some cash. So Lucas, I was definitely interested in, you know, his dual second or forward center wing, but he's probably not going to be for me personally. Um, maybe if we get some certainty on an 80 minute roll, then I think I'd be all over him. But with him and Pierce Paul minute sharing, He's probably not going to be for me, I think, at the beginning of the season. So before we start talking about some more pod options in the center wing, I wanted to tackle a lot of the higher owned kind of value options in center wing. And I think a lot of the you know main discussion will be around them. So big list here, but we'll go through everyone one by one. I have put some notes as well against each of them, hopefully to help out as well. So number one is Ethan Strange uh, of the Raiders, 238k, close to bottom dollar. He was about 43% owned at the time that I pulled these ownership stats. Now, obviously, the risks with the Canberra Raiders cheapies, which include Chevy Stewart, Ethan Strange, and K.O. Weeks, is we don't have any security or we don't have any certainty on the job security, I should say. Now, in the trials, in the most recent one, he and K.O. Weeks played together in the halves. I will say that Strange looked better than K.O. Weeks. You know, he set up a try for himself, uh, but then he did a spear tackle, and um, he was potentially looking at facing a suspension, although some news has come out that he's actually only going to be copying a $1,000 fine. And he could, and well, he should be available then for round one. Big, big watch for him on TLT. But my feeling is that he's going to get the number six spot over KO Weeks. Now, he is available in center wing and the 5'8", 
I'd probably prefer to put him in the center wing spot, but if we get other cheapies crop up in center wing, then I think I'd be happy to put him in my backup 5-8 spot as well to likely Dylan Brown. So I think the ownership being so high is warranted. If he gets that spot in round in, in round one at number six, uh, probably close to a must cheapie, I would say. So definitely very high on the radar. And I think hard to comment without seeing the full round one team list, but it, it looks like he's going to get that spot, I believe, uh, for round one. Next up, Ben Tavojevic, or Bobo, we should say, 277k. Um, the column I should have mentioned as well is that are they going to be in the 17? What I've put is a Y-S for Bobo, which means yes, and I believe it's going to be a start. So if you see a Y-B, dash, uh, well, there's no Y-B, dash but if it's like a TBD, it could be that, a bench roll. But for Bobo, I think he's going to be a starter because uh, it looks like Schuster's not going to be available for round one. And Schuster just seems to be having these conditioning issues, which just seem to be ongoing. So even if he comes back into the team for Manly, there's no certainty that he's going to stay there for a long time. So I feel like for now, for the time being, on the information that we know, Bobo should be the starter on the left edge uh, for the Sea Eagles. And uh, I, I, I like that. You know, 277k, is, as I said before, we're struggling to get cheapies. So at a sub 300k for a starter for Manly, uh, look, I'll take Burbo. He's been kind of on the precipice of Supercoach relevance for a long, long time. He's dual second or forward center wing, which adds to his appeal. Uh, he'll be in my round one team, I think, barring any TLT surprises. Now, the next up was Bronton Cherry. Um, 300 and uh, Zeri, sorry, I should say, not Cherry. <laughs> 345k. Um, I think based on his performances over the last two trials, I think he will be one of the starters in the centers. It looks like it will be him and Stephen Crichton. Um, it looks like Crichton won't be trialed at fullback for the time being. It's going to be with Blake Taff. But with, uh, with Zeri, we don't have much in terms of historical supercoach numbers. His previous average was 56 with a 35 base power um, in that 2019 season for the Cronulla Sharks. I think that 35 base power is fairly repeatable because he looks like he has been willing to take runs and do work. I think he ran for like more than 120 meters on the weekend in his trial. So I think he's actually looking like a pretty good option. At first, I thought the high ownership was more just based on name, but I think name... And also, I think what he's shown so far in the trial at 345k, I'm actually kind of leaning him over someone like a Drew Hutchinson at the moment, who's at a similar price. We, I'll actually just talk about Hutchinson as well. But uh, with Zeri, I feel like he's looking a little bit more of a certain starter. And I think his performances have been pretty good. Work rate seems to be there as well. So I think he looks like a decent mid-range kind of centering option. And he's At the moment, I believe he's in my round one team, and I think he'll probably stick there for me. Uh, Drew Hutchinson, I'll quickly tackle off all the uh, Bulldog options. So Hutchinson at 355k, looks like he's going to be the starting halfback for them uh, as well. Um, He had a few limited games for the Roosters at halfback last year where he scored 28, 130, and 48. More interesting with Hutchinson was also the base stats that he accrued in those appearances at halfback. So looking at it here, the games last season, he scored 32, 50, and 44 in base. So generally seems to be a bit of a high work rate guy when he's on the field. Now, admittedly, I haven't seen much of that uh, Bulldog second trial, but in the first trial, he did look fairly good. Uh, he was in one of my teams originally, but um, he's not there in the, at there anymore because I had to save money, and so I went down to Zeri from him. But I think Hutchinson could be a viable option, you know, playing at halfback. I guess it comes down to, you know, do we think that the uh, Bulldog's going to be scoring points? Similar argument, I guess, for Zeri. thing with Zeri, though, I feel like that base, that base power average that he's got is probably going to be a little bit more safer than the Hutchinson and I guess my fear with Hutchinson as well like I know he's likely going to be the starter but Toby Sexton is there in the in the reserve grades and I think Sexton is a quality player like I'm surprised that he's actually not in that team so I feel like if I've got any doubt it could be that Sexton could potentially come into that team at some point so Hutchinson I don't think is a bad option it looks like he's going to get the start from the beginning of the year but I feel like I'm a bit more confident in the job security of Zeri compared to Hutchinson. So small reason why I'm probably looking to go with Zeri over Hutchinson. But I think you could technically go both. They're at a, both at a good price, but probably a little bit too much exposure to the Bulldogs for me personally to be going there. Uh, the last one from the Bulldogs is uh, Jamin Salmon, 317k. I've put TBD as is in the 17. I should probably change that to yes, he should definitely be in the 17. The question is, is going to be, is he going to be the starting lock? Uh, or is he going to be coming off the bench? From what we've seen in the trials, it looks like he's going to be the starting lock for the Bulldogs with uh, Josh Curran actually coming off the bench. Now, I don't think that really dents Curran's appeal massively because he still has a pretty good work rate coming off the bench, but it does potentially add some value for Jamin Salmon as well. 
So looking at his numbers from last season, whenever he played over the 35 minutes, which was his season average last year, uh, he had an average of 49. So again, probably going to be playing a similar role that what he did for the Panthers, where he was kind of a link man or played a bit on the edge. Look, if he gets an average, if he plays more than 35 minutes for the Bulldogs, even if that 49 becomes like a 40, his price had an average of 31. So you're getting nine points of value. You should still make some money. So I don't mind Salmon. Um, again, you probably can't go all three of Zeri, Hutchinson, and James Salmon. So I think for that, I'd probably go Zeri and Salmon as my preferred two. Again, Salmon just being a little bit cheaper than Hutchinson. Salmon is also a dual. You can get him in your second or forward, and you can also get him in your center wing. So again, just adds to his appeal a little bit more than maybe say like a Hutchinson, despite Hutchinson also being a dual halfback center wing. So I probably shouldn't really use that as an argument against Hutchinson. But um, yeah, Salmon is not currently in my team, but he could be there as a nice way to make some money to fill a gap. And uh, yeah, I think he's a pretty decent option. It looks like he's going to be getting the start, but let's see subject to TLT round one. So going back up towards the top of the list, we've got Taylor May at 459k. Um, as we saw in the World Club Challenge against Wigan Warriors, playing at left center. Now, Sunia Taruva did go down injured, but it looks like it's going to be a short, uh, fairly short recovery and he's probably going to be fine at least for round one, if not maybe like a round two. So any dream of Taylor May going back to left wing is probably over. But look, I know some people don't love that Taylor May is playing at center. And, you know, at a 459 uh, price tag, he's priced at about a 44 average. The way I look at it as, look, he's a he's a good work rate uh, player. He had a base average, I think, in the high 20s uh, in 2022 when he was fully fit. I believe it was around 28, if I'm not mistaken. It was off the wing. But as we saw before, like, Isaac Tungo had a base average of 36. Brian Toto, 35. Dylan Edwards, I know, is like in the high 30s. It's just the way that the Panthers play and get out of their own end is the, all the backs take lots of runs. So I feel like Taylor May's base stats, even at center, are going to be fine. I mean, the base stats are going to be higher, to be honest, playing at center. He's going to make more tackles than he was playing on the wing. The attacking stats probably maybe go slightly down, but look, a 64 average in 2022... Isaac Tungo has scored well when playing at left center as well. I think he had a high 50s average in his debut season. Matt Burden, when he played at center in the left, uh, when he played at left center, I believe he had an average of 64. We're talking about the Panthers here, high point scoring team. I don't really see too many issues with Taylor May at that price tag. Even if you think that the attacking stats are going to reduce and he goes maybe like low 50s, mid 50s average, you're still getting 10 points of value out of him. And the upside is definitely there because he's playing in that gun Panthers team. So for me, he's pretty much a lock in my round one team. He has not left all season and I'm not really concerned about him playing left center because we've seen other Panthers left centers score well for Supercoach. So I'm not too concerned. Kale Iro from the Sharks, going to pass over him fairly quickly. It just feels like to me he's not going to be a starter. I feel like it's just still going to be Sifa Talakai on the left center. So not one currently in my team and not in consideration. Same with Chevy Stewart. Ricky Stewart basically came out and said that Jordan Ralpenar is going to be the fullback. And so Chevy Stewart's going to be sticking in reserve grade. So that kind of ends the hope of him. Now, Jack Bostock of the Dolphins, 314k. Uh, he's been in my team for most of the preseason, more because he's just been a fairly cheap guy at 314k with a good Dolphins draw. I'm not expecting massive things out of him because we've seen in the trials he scored, I think, two tries and a line break. And I think he scored like in the 40s both games. So he doesn't seem to have really high work rate. Um, despite even scoring attacking stats, he wasn't even cracking 50. Other risk with him is he's going to be on the left wing, which we saw earlier in the try scoring map. Not generally the preferred side for the Dolphins. And he's going to either have, he's probably likely going to have Tessie New playing outside of him, similar to Farnworth. He's not generally a guy who likes to pass the ball a lot. So I think Bostock could be frustrating. I can see a lot of kind of high 20s, low 30s with him. I'll probably still start with him, to be honest. I might not, hopefully I don't have to rely on him as a starting four center wing. Hopefully he might be in my reserves because he's at that price tag where if he just nabs a couple of tries in a few consecutive consecutive games, just make some money and then we can look to offload him. That's how dire the cheapy situation is at the moment. So he's going to likely be in my uh, squad of 25, but hopefully not in my f uh, starting four centers because he looks like a guy with a low work rate. Um, there is also a risk that Jake Avrila comes in that team. Like he got signed from the Bulldogs for a reason. And if he comes in and Tessie New goes to the wing, then that's the dream over for, Bo for Bostock. But I'd rather start with him and hope he does well. And if it becomes an issue, we'll just trade him out eventually. Uh, no biggie. So that's my kind of standing at the moment on Bostock. With Xavier Savage, it looks like he's going to be on one of the wing spots for the Raiders. I'm personally not too keen though at 350k because 
he had a good spell playing at fullback for the Raiders in 2022, average 58. But when he's playing on the wing, he had an average of 14. So he's not a base that heavy guy. And I'm personally not too keen when at 350k, like it feels like you can get someone with a bit more reliability about him, like a Zeri, maybe even a Jameis Salmon, at, and they're coming in a little bit cheaper than Savage. So he's personally not for me. Fire Longo from, I think that's how you pronounce it, from the Storm, hasn't been in any of my teams. I was surprised at his ownership all preseason. It doesn't look like he's going to be in that team. It looks like the back line is going to be Pappenhausen at fullback, Nick Meany at centre, other centres likely going to be Ramus Smith, uh, and then the wingers, you've got Will Warbrick, and um, I can't remember the guy on the left wing, Apollo, oh, Xavier Coates, of course, um, silly me, but I just don't see him being a starter, so not for me personally. Uh, Jesse Arthurs, he's probably the most expensive guy here, 376k. He's currently in my squad at the moment. Now, he's always giving the impression of someone who works hard and got a good work rate, but when I looked at the numbers, that's not quite the case. <laughs> he has a base average of 19 from last season and his highest base power all season last year was 29 and so i'm starting to think maybe arthur's i fade even though he's in my team currently because the draw is tough for the broncos to start off with and he's not a base that heavy guy you really do need those attacking stats now if he plays on the right wing i mean look it's a good spot to be outside of uh, selwyn cobo look i still may end up with him despite what i just said because he's in a good broncos team I just think I'd probably preface that he's not going to be an amazing option um, who you're going to make maybe 250k from. Just because his base stats are so low, you really do need those attacking stats. So Arthur's is a watch for me in in the sense of, it's not necessarily watch, I can't watch any more uh, preseason, but I'm toing and froing on him. Originally, I was very keen on him because he was playing for a Broncos team, but looking at those stats, he feels like someone who, if he doesn't get those attacking stats, he's going to be a little bit frustrating. So yeah, not sold on Arthur's um, if in doubt I may just start with him because he's one of the more expensive options and we can downgrade but if I can't fit him in that's probably just going to have to be how it is because I might I may need that extra 10 20k to do something else elsewhere in the team uh, with Nick Kotrick from the uh, Raiders 274k he looks like he's generally going to be a starter for them as well on the right wing did score a try in the most recent trial as well um, last season had an average of 31 in over in 70 minute plus games Previously, he's averaged 41, 43, and 48. So the issue I have with Kotrick is that despite the good price tag, he seems like that's kind of what he's going to actually get you is kind of like a mid to low 30s average because if you see that 41, 43, and 48, those are all declining. So he's been going down and down and down over the last few seasons. As we saw before, the Raiders are not a team that typically score a lot of tries on their edges. And playing outside of Timiko, I feel like Timiko is going to command more of the ball. He's not necessarily a big passer. So Kotrick, I feel like it's just going to be a very frustrating own. So he's currently not in my team. Uh, I did have Tommy Tillow originally, but it looks like he's going to be an unlikely starter. So not currently in my squad. Uh, Schiller from the Raiders, he's actually looked fairly good in the trials. But the reason I'm not too keen on him is that I just think he's going to be occupying one of the center spots that Seb, uh, Seb Chris is going to get back when he comes back into that team post-suspension. So I feel like Schiller has got a short shelf life. So not for me personally. Um, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. Um, apologies. Is it Lea Tuel uh, from the Warriors? Uh, big apologies uh, for, that, uh, for that out there. Uh, but 238k. I just don't see him getting a spot in the starting back line. I feel like the center is going to be RTS and Rocco Berry. So just don't see him being a prospect. Kane Bradley from the Melbourne Storm. Should talk about him. Should have talked about him a little bit earlier. But he's come out of nowhere. Starting back row for the Melbourne Storm. He has not let Sean Bloor coming in uh, take his spot so far, at least in the trials. Um, he's actually just today recording on Monday, been given 2RF and center wing dual status. Look, if he's starting come round one TLT, that 3.3% is going to, I think it's now 7%, but that's just going to keep going up and up and up. He's currently in my squad. He's a good enabler being sec, uh, second row forward center wing dual. You know, you can have him in your second row forward. You can have Burbo in your center wing, and you've got that nice little rotation available already there for re start of round one. So I like it from that point of view. Even if he's starting and Sean Blue's on the bench, he doesn't need to do much at 238k to make money. So... He's currently in my team, and I think he's going to be one of the more popular cheapies. Uh, Tom Eisenhuth of the Dragons at 356k. What The notes that I've got against him is that he's probably going to be in the starting 13 early on in the year, but Luciano Lelua looks like he's going to be going to the Dragons, and I do feel like he's going to eventually make his way into the team. So again, with Eisenhuth, he's not necessarily bottom dollar. He's like 356k. He's probably more likely to be one of those guys who gets you low 40s, mid 40s, which could add some stability, 
to your center wing. But again, short shelf life, I'm probably not too keen on that basis as well. And uh, lastly from the Warriors, we've got, is it Torpiki? Uh, I'm really butchering these uh, Maori surnames. Apologies to any Kiwi listeners out there. But um, it looks like he's going to be the starting fullback for the Warriors until CNK is back. Now, the news with CNK is that it picked up a hamstring injury. He's probably not going to be back for the Warriors until round four. I still think it's worth starting with Torpiki, despite even only being available to you for maybe the first three to four rounds. And the main reason is that you're going to save trades if you start with him and then have to trade him out versus if you don't start with him and then eventually you feel like you need to bring him back in, then you're going to be using two trades to get him in and then eventually back out again. And the reason I think it's okay to start is because hamstrings are just tricky, tricky injuries. Like they may say CNK is back round four, but we've seen this plenty of times in the past where, and I've been burnt by this myself personally, but you avoid a guy because, oh, this player is going to come back and take a spot so I'm not going to go him and then that player who's due to come back has a setback or their recovery just takes longer and then all of a sudden to a pick he's played six rounds and he's actually got two or three price changes and you maybe missed out on like 100k so those kind of reasons is why I'm happy to start with to picky and um, look if he's out by round four you can downgrade him at that point but he still could offer some points as well um, if he is playing at fullback for the Warriors so he's actually currently also in my center wing reserve and he's probably looking like not a must chibi because he does have a short shelf life but looks like a fairly viable option to start off with as well in round one so i skipped over this category before but these are kind of more higher priced gun center wing options between 610 to 655k um, all very low owned the highest one here is fine worth at 7.8 uh, percent but i thought i'd circle back to some of these options um, so brian kelly number one here at 0.2 percent owned so if you want a pod uh, Brian Kelly could be a man. We know that the Titans have a good draw to start off with for the first five rounds. They do have a buy though in round two. Kelly just feels like an enigma. He always seems to offer mu- uh, so much. He had a season average of 64 last season. I believe he had like a, something in the 50s the year prior, but he did also have something in the 60s the year before that as well. So that 64 is not necessarily a fluke. We know that he can do that. Decent base power as well, average of 48. Good base last year as well, actually, of 35. And he plays on the good side of the Titans, which is the left-hand side. My only concern, though, is with Fafida not being in that team, I just feel like that left-side attack is going to be diminished. And so I feel like whatever benefits Kelly was getting playing outside of Fafida, he's going to lose that for the first three to four rounds. And that's when the juicy draw is. And so I feel like you're not going to get your value for the first four rounds. And then once Fafida's back, draw toughens up a little bit. So again, it's a high price tag, 650k. We talked about RTS, Hamaso's cheaper, Carraz is cheaper. I just kind of prefer those options. Uh, doesn't have much of a ceiling as well. 14% of the time, he was scoring over 90 last season. Now, Joey Manu definitely does have a ceiling. Uh, five games scoring over 90 last year. Uh, so that's 25% of the time. Decent base power, 49. And with Manu, we just know that he's a guy who... Anytime you get him in the fullback jersey or the 5 out jersey, um, just becomes an absolute elite option for Supercoach. And a big regression from 2023 compared to what he did in 2022. So he's one who I've got a close eye on. Probably won't start because the draw is fairly tough for the Roosters. But we know that he's a guy who can flick the switch. And sometimes the opposition doesn't even always matter. But again, high price tag. So personally not going to be going with him. Nor Stephen Crichton. It doesn't look like he's going to be goal kicking. And playing in a Bulldogs team who don't have a really great draw and are still going to be working things out in attack. I feel like if you're going to go for a Bulldogs and a wing, just go Bronson Zeri, who's 300k cheaper than Stephen Crichton. Now, Farnworth is definitely an interesting option at 632k. If you're not comfortable, say, with the base of Hamaso, but you still want a kind of Dolphin center wing just to take advantage of that good draw. Farnworth can fit that bill because he's got a base power average of 48. So we know that he's got a good work rate. So you're generally going to be getting low 50s from him even on a bad day. Uh, And we know that he's got that good uh, potential to score some additional tries. Only had one game though over 90 last year. So only 4% of the time. So again, he feels like a guy is going to be more of a safe pick for you you know he'll get you kind of between 50 to 65 most of the time um occasionally we'll get those 70s and 80s if he does nab you know a try and maybe an extra attacking start which could happen at the beginning of the season when the dolphins have got a really good draw so i think he's probably one of the better pod center wings uh, because you can capitalize on a good draw and he's more of a marquee signing as well for the dolphins uh but i'm probably not just going there just more for price tag but i do prefer him as a pod option to say someone like any of the top three no, still below 10% ownership. I think he's a fairly good option. Zach Lomax, I was actually very keen on 
way, way back early in the preseason because of the really decent draw for the Dragons. Uh, Titans, Dolphins in the first two uh, before they've got Tigers in round six. Uh, it does toughen up a little bit, I guess, with Cowboys, Manly, and Knights. I just think with the Dragons at the start of the season, attack is not going to be their priority. It's going to be defense, defense, defense. That's what Shane Flanagan, I think, lives and breeds. And despite Lomax still being the goal kicker, which is a benefit, I just don't see how many more points they're going to be scoring compared to last year, at least early on. So I feel like that average of 62 for Lomax is kind of what you're going to get from him. Maybe it's more towards the lower end. For him, I feel like I want to see the Dragons really be cooking in attack, and we know that we can then benefit on that goal kicking. So personally, not for me. Same with Mulatalo. Like, it's weird because Mulatalo was a very in-demand center option last year at times, when especially when the Sharks had a good draw. And they do have a good draw for the first four rounds, like Bulldogs, Tigers, and Canberra uh, before the buy in round five. Mulatalo is definitely a genuine option as a pod. I think you just really need to be believing the Sharks attack um, to go him. And at 628k, I feel like if you're already going Hines, you know, you're going to have Hines and Mulatalo out for round five. Uh, I don't mind Mulatalo if you're happy to, you know, if you've got other things set up in your team where you're going to feel like you're not going to be using trades. Come round five, if you say Mulatalo, I'm owning him for the fourth, uh, for the first four rounds. Don't really care about anything else. After that, I'm going to trade him to the next best option. Maybe you look at Mulatalo as a stepping stone to a Mazu. For example, we spoke about Mazu being a good option in round five. Then maybe Mulatalo could be someone that you can consider. Again, you just need to be willing to bet that he's got that ability to get those attacking stats in the first four weeks because he's not a base stat winger, only a base average of 23. So you just need to have, I guess, the risk appetite that he can get you those 30, 30s and 35s without the attacking stats. Um, even if he scores them, he's probably still going to be only scoring low 60s to high 60s. Um, so I think you really need to be believing in the Sharks fast, uh, starting fast, I think, to go him at the beginning of the year, with probably a view that maybe by round five you do look to trade him out, especially if you're pairing him with a Nico Hines. Finally, Bradman Best, uh, just under 5% ownership. We saw him score a good try against the Melbourne Storm. I guess that's the upside that you're buying into with Bradman Best and the potential of the Knights to continue focusing down that left-hand side attack. Uh, with Kalen Ponga, of course. Um, so I don't mind him as a pod. Fairly good base average of 32. Previously, when he's averaged over 60, it was also in the low 60s. I think that was in 2020. Um, he's unfortunately been hampered with a lot of injuries as well. That's probably one small knock against him is that he can uh, sometimes uh, pick up a few niggling injuries. Not necessarily always his fault, but it just seems to happen to him. So maybe a small risk with him. Uh, with him, again, he's playing at center. I generally would prefer getting the wingers from teams. They will generally get those bigger... Um, attacking stats. So I'm personally not going to be starting with Bradman Best. I feel like with KP, I've got enough exposure for the Knights, at least for the beginning of the season. I can see the benefit of the stack, though, uh, going Bradman Best and maybe also going KP. So if you're really buying into the Knights as an overall attack, I don't mind that as a potential stack option to do with both KP and Bradman Best. But if you don't have Ponga, like best is maybe then an option to try to cover the left-hand side edge of the Knights, but I think in that case, you probably just go with Ponga. Um, decent floor for him, base power average of 39. I just feel like with him, Mazu is really the target uh, for KP, and I think Bradman Best isn't always going to be scoring most of those attacking stats. So for me, probably not one to start with, but maybe round five could be an interesting prospect to capitalize on that really good draw. Now, finally, if you're looking for more pods in your centering, I've picked a few that I thought could be relevant options. I'll, I'll quickly cover off Mike Acevo because it looks like he's going to be suspended for the first three rounds for Parramatta, so probably no longer an option. But that may mean you might want to go someone like a Will Penasini. 573k, 56 average. It feels like that 56 average is kind of value, so I don't really see a lot of cash growth in him. Fairly decent draw for Parramatta, but... Um, you know, if you're looking for a more steady AD guy, he's probably one that you could go. But at 573k, I would go RTS and take that money saving as well and get the vibes as well. Other couple of Sharks players, if you weren't interested in paying that higher amount for Mulatalo, Jesse Raymin and Katoa, very different options, both playing down the right-hand side. Raymin is going to be your base, that heavy guy. Uh, he averaged, let me have a look at it here, 33 in base. Sorry, it was just below me. 33 in base. Compare that to, uh, compare that to Katoa, uh, 21. So it depends, are you more interested in the guy who's going to give you the more meat and potatoes in the 50s and 60s, or the guy who's got the 20s but can go a little bit bigger? Although with Katoa, it was a pretty disappointing year last year for him, and I would just be too afraid of the really low scores that can, Katoa can give you uh, to really punt on him. And I do think superior options are Mulatalo and Raimi, and they generally tend to perform a little bit better for the Sharks compared to Katoa. Um, 
I like my favorite would still be Mulatalo out of all three of them, but Raymond could be one if you potentially want to save maybe 50k. Now Ty Munro, 483k for the Rabbitohs, was really good in the brief four games he had last year for the Rabbitohs. Now he had even worse base stats than Katoa, 17 average. He's 100% a attacking stat guy that you need for a really good run for the Rabbitohs because if he doesn't get those attacking stats, he's going to give you some really low scores. And when I look at their draw, it's pretty tough. Apart from Bulldogs in round four, there are some tough, tough games until round 10. So I'm not looking at him really at all, but he could prove me wrong if the Rabbitohs come out and kill it. But I'm just a bit afraid of those low uh, base stats for him. Tony Staggs, I know will be interesting to some people with an average of 62 last season. With Staggs, I feel like it's just very hard to time it. He just seems to go 40s, 40s, 50s, 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 and then three games in a row goes 90, 110, 90, and you're just like, oh my god, need to get this guy, and then he goes back to disappointment. I've had a lot of disappointment with Katoni Staggs, so I'm a little bit more biased there, but I probably won't be starting with him. Uh, Murray Talangi and Zach Labart. So Leibart looks like he could be getting that center spot vacated by Petahiku for the Cowboys. Now he had a 57 average last season when he played a few games, so he's probably offering some value at 465k, but just feels a little bit of an awkward price tag for someone who historically hasn't shown a lot from a super coach point of view, so I'm happy to fade for the time being and maybe look to him as a potential downgrade, especially if we see the, the Cowboys start really, really hot. Um, same with Taolonghi as well at 528k. He's the winger, so I'd probably generally have a preference for him compared to the center. And Taolonghi is playing outside of Val Holmes. So that's probably a side I think the Cowboys will prefer to attack. Although we did see Drinkwater really dominate on the right-hand side, though, uh, on the weekend trials. So one of those two, I think, close watches for me, but probably not ones for me to start off with personally. But a few pot options there for you. All right, guys, that is my center wing analysis. Appreciate I can't talk about every single center. There's just so many of them, but hopefully that covered a lot of the bigger talking points uh, in this preseason. So do give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Please consider subscribing as well. Next video will be the fullbacks. See you all in the next one.